Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to just, we're going to be talking about network formation models. And in, in starting off, I wanted to sort of segue from what we've finished with in the, the morning lecture and then start into the network formation models. But a nice segue for that is, is looking at the shelling tipping model to give you an idea of, of how um, some simple frictions can actually cause fairly dramatic um, segregation patterns. And yeah. it's not exactly a network formation model, but if you think of, of people's, you know, think of the, the friends of people as being their immediate neighbors in some geographic plane, then the showing model gives you an idea of why you might see these kinds of patterns emerge. And the model was, was very simple, and so I'll, I'll just sort of take you through. There's a nice website here. This is um, ncase.me at polygons. It's sort of a nice illustration uh, of it, one of the nicer ones I've seen. And, you know, the shelling model is you've got these shapes, people, whatever. They're, they're of different types here. We've got squares and triangles. And they have some slight preferences for what their neighborhood composition looks like. So in this case, um, the supposition is that you prefer to be in a neighborhood that has at least a third of the population that looks like you. So you might want to be in a neighborhood which is fairly diverse, but you want a minimum uh, level of the population that looks like you, okay? And so what, the, what this website does is it takes you through a situation here. You know, it's randomly placed a bunch of the people down, the squares and the triangles. The ones that are, are tilting, tipping here back and forth are the ones that aren't happy with their, with their neighborhoods. So for instance, this one is surrounded mostly by blues doesn't have a third of its neighbors that are, are also triangles, so this one wants to move. This one has no neighbors that are triangles and so forth. So ones that have fewer than this threshold of a third are ones that want to move. And so the, you know, the starting point here is you're supposed to just take one of these and you know, randomly move them. Still not happy, right? So move it again, ah, it's happy, right? And so I, I start moving these triangles around and I try and find happy spots for them. I can move the squares around and so forth. And, and eventually, I'm going to have to, I'll, I'll stop once everybody's happy and no longer tipping. Okay, so these people are, are moving around if, if they're not happy, and so I try and help them out. Okay, well, um, that can be a little bit tedious on this, this board, but um, it has one where you can just, it'll do it for you, right? So it, it's moving them around, and what, what it's pointing out is that what you end up with, even when you have fairly low thresholds, for moving, I just, you know, I, I only need a third of my population to be happy um, where I am, that can still end up moving people around and the relocation ends up being one where you end up with fairly segregated patterns, even with low thresholds. What, so, what, what is the rule that you're using there for relocation? So the relocation is just move to an, an, another empty square and then if you're still unhappy, it can move again, but it just so randomly right picks a square. Random. Completely random, yeah, yeah. So pick any open square and move to it. Happy, and if you, happy is a third, uh, like you. Yeah, exactly. At least a third. At least a third on this one, right? And so this one, you know, you end up this. Um, they have some segregation um, uh, measure that they're they're looking at, and it sort of moves along. And on this website, you can you can actually control the um, level. So you know, we can run it. Uh, run it with the, the one third, we get certain patterns popping out. We can also set, let's suppose we set the threshold to be like 45% instead, right? So I, I still am happy to be in a segregated, in a, in a diverse community, but I want to make sure now that I'm close to half the population. And then you, you, you know, we'll start with a new board, um, and then you start running it. And as you get closer and closer to a half, you're going to get more and more segregated societies coming out. So even though you're still below 50%, the way that this, these um, shapes will rearrange themselves will end up with, with strongly segregated patterns. So this is just sort of an interesting site um, to look at. There's a, been a bunch of papers that have been written about the, the shelling model. The shelling model is actually fairly difficult to solve in general, but under certain assumptions on certain kinds of, of spaces, you can, you can get analytic results for, for what the convergences are going to tend to be like and so forth. So it's, it's sort of an interesting place to play around, and it gives you an idea that you know, that, that w to get strong homophily, we don't need necessarily really strong biases 
um, in terms of how people want to form their friendships. It could be enough that they just want to live in a neighborhood that has some minimal uh, amount of, of their own type, and that can end up you know, pushing things in ways that end up looking very different from that. Yeah, so this is um, ncase.me um, polygons. But it, you, in the first, in the, there's actually a link to it in the slides from the first um, lecture this morning. So you can find a link there. Yes. Yeah, so um, there, are, there are, so uh, depends, so the, there's a threshold and I don't remember exactly. It depends on the dimensions of the space that you're working on and then the, what the minimal threshold is. So, so, so when you start getting a segregation pattern. So you could imagine that below some level, if I set this threshold close enough to zero, that I won't get any effect. Um, but, but I think here you actually get, you do get a phase transition and it depends on sort of how di what the dimension of the space is and then um, what the, the threshold is. And I don't remember exactly what it is. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so it's actually, yeah. Um, it's, it's a fascinating model because it's a very rich, so imagine that some people prefer to be in, you have to, you have to make some people prefer to be in neighborhoods which really don't have any of their types in order to counter this. Because the, the, uh, it, it's not easy to get, the mo to get a model that doesn't have this effect once you put in a minimum for some of the population. So there's actually lots of variations of the shelling model that have been studied. I, I don't want to go into too much detail of it, but it, it's sort of an interesting model um, which illustrates the fact that these small, uh, small forces can, can have a large impact when you start putting them together and they're amplified off of, of, of the movements of other nodes. Okay. So back to this afternoon's talk. Um, slideshow. Okay, so again, uh, the slides are, are, you can find them on my <laughs> web page. This is just jackson.networkformationestimation.pdf for the slides for this afternoon. And, and actually also this, uh, tomorrow morning. So I, I just put sort of them together and we'll see how much material we get through this, the, this afternoon and then we'll continue on tomorrow. Okay. So network formation, you know, we've looked at different networks. We've seen some properties they have. And the basic kinds of questions now we're going to wonder are which networks are forming. And we're going to look at two different classes of models, random graph models. And these, these kinds of models will answer questions of how. So we'll just posit some particular stochastic process, and that'll generate networks that can begin to mimic the empirical observations that we have. And we can, they, that can answer how. So we can say, okay, we want something with clustering. How can we get it? Um, then we'll look at economic game theoretic models. And, and I put here why. These will be ones where people are making choices. And that'll give us, so we'll be able to tie together some particular feature. So for instance, why is there high clustering? Well, it's because of a certain uh, incentive that people have in forming relationships. And so that'll give us an, a different answer in terms of not just an algorithm for finding networks that have these, process, these features, but a, a, a model which then t ties it back to primitives. So these are going to be very complementary models. And the advantage of the random graph models is they're going to be much easier to work with in terms of heterogeneity and statistical properties. And so these will be nice for working with data. These will be nice for developing parables and understanding simple kinds of, of ideas as to what might be generating these things. And, and there's sort of a, a nascent literature now, which is building models which sort of bridge these. Um, but, it, but it's tough going. And, and so at the end of, of tomorrow morning's lecture, I'll spend more time talking about, you know, where are the holes in the literature and, and what really needs to be filled. And, and the... the the, the merging of these and developing models which are rich enough to take to data and yet allow us to answer economic questions, that's where the real frontier is in this stuff. And so what I'm going to do is just take you through a few examples of, of each different class of models um, just to give you an idea of how they work, but the, this is a rich class and so I'm not, we're not going to have any, nearly enough time to go through all of those obviously an hour and a half, 
but um, we'll, we'll just touch on, on a couple of those. So when do the right networks form? Um, we can ask things like, you know, how, how is network formation affected by bargaining or other kinds of features? Um, how does it depend on context? So there's going to be a fairly rich set of questions to, to look at here. Um, uses of models, well, they're, they're used for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you know, we could be do, doing basic hypothesis testing. You know, why are we seeing homophily? So we could write down a different model, go and see whether it can, can uh, mimic the data. Can we, can we reject certain hypotheses? Um, why do we see clustering at certain levels? So it can begin to look at, at basic questions like that. It could be useful for um, counterfactuals and policy evaluation. So if we want to say, look, what's going to happen um, after to trade policy after the Brexit? Well, we have to have some, some generative model of how networks form of trade relationships and then try and make predictions based on that. And so if we want to understand what's going to happen in this counterfactual world, well, now not a, no longer counterfactual, um, <laughs> unfortunately. No, no, no we, we, we really have to rely on some, some forward-looking modeling to figure out what, how that's going to evolve. And so that's another reason for having these kinds of models. Um, and then, you know, sort of, I think this is another frontier that Jan will probably, it'll be implicit in a lot of Jan's talk, which is that, you know, a lot of times when we're looking at networked behavior and you're trying to figure out how people influence each other, the problem is that the network is endogenous. So the relationships are coming out of some process. They're being driven by people's characteristics. So it's not by accident that I co-authored with Ben Golub. It's not by accident that you people are in this room. And so trying to understand what that means for how we got here and what it means about our characteristics and what it means about behavior, those kinds of things are, are going to be important in determining our behaviors. And so if we don't take that into account when, when actually looking at the behaviors, we might get the estimation drastically wrong. And so really taking this as an input into modeling behavior is going to be important as we get to peer effects and understanding peer effects and understanding why people behave the way they do. But that's, that's still a, an area that's more frontier than, than really well studied. Okay, so approaches. Um, so the way we'll sort of go through things is I'll talk a little bit about classic random graphs, the erdos rini random graphs, then um, switch to the economic um, s approach, so strategic formation where people have costs and benefits to relationships, they're maximizing utilities, so we'll get our, our economics in. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about growing random graphs, so then we'll go back to random graphs, and these will have certain kinds of properties. And then I'm going to talk at the end um, tomorrow morning about econometric models, various types of econometric models, and I, I sort of break them, I think of them in five different classes these days. So there's sort of five approaches to dealing with, with network estimation. And, um, you know, we'll take a look mostly at block models, and then I'm going to say words about some other kinds of models that are out there. And I'll tell you more or less the strengths and weaknesses of each of these, but we're not going to have time to look at, at you know, an hour and a half, obviously, we're not going to have uh, time to go into these in, in detail. But I'll give you an idea of what's out there, where the frontier is, and, and what the, the really problems with each are. And again, the, the difficulty is really going to be these are complex animals and we want simple models to fit them and we're going to miss on some dimension no matter what's happening. And so there's also going to be trade-offs of comp com computation and practical estimation as well as how well they fit. Okay, so let's start with classic random graph models. And again, we're going to start with this um, erdash renyi uh, graphs and these are useful to keep in the back of our minds for understanding basic properties that are going to emerge in graphs and trying to understand how they're modeled. And again, we're thinking about this as independent probability P of each link on N nodes. And then we've got this degree distribution. Um, it's going to be binomial, approximated by a Poisson distribution. So it's a very simple model in, in terms of its basic building blocks. And um, what that model gave ro rise to in the mathematics literature, the random graph literature, was the theory of threshold functions. So when you go back, so the idea here is um, what we're going to be doing, as, as Eric pointed out, suppose that we fix n nodes, and now we start talking about what's the probability that I see a particular graph. Well, every graph has a positive probability because any configuration of links could arise with a positive probability. So in order to say anything meaningful about what the graphs look like, we're going to have to look at limits. 
we're going to have to do law of large numbers calculations where we say as the number of links gets large, then the chance that we see a graph that has a certain property is going to one or going to zero. Those are going to be the kinds of theorems that are out there. And so we'll be able to say something about limiting probabilities, but it's going to be very difficult to say anything meaningful about probabilities of certain graphs appearing in finite samples. Okay, and, and uh, we, uh, there are finite sample kinds of theorems that are out there, but they're, they're tricky. So w the, the idea of a threshold is when we look at this, um, let me find the, the chalk too. So we can think of our n is getting, go, growing to infinity. So we're going to let the number of nodes become large. And now we've got this p, which is going to be uh, doing something along the sequence. Often we're going to be thinking of p as, as a function of n. So for instance, let's suppose that we think about, you know, people having on average, say, 20 friends. Well, if we want people on average to have 20 friends out of 120 people in this room, then we want them to have a, a p of about a one-sixth. If we start saying, okay, now we, we, we look at them in a, in a world of, of millions of people, then that probability is going to have to be much smaller in order for people still to have 20 friends, roughly on average, as the graph gets larger and larger. So we're going to want to keep this p changing with n in order to sort of keep the, the degree ha having reasonable properties as the number of nodes explodes. Okay? So we want to think of p as, as a function of n for, for a variety of reasons. So the, the basic think world now is large graph, what can we say about the properties of the graph? So um, t of n is going to be a threshold function if when we look at the, some property of a graph, and a property of a graph is just going to be some description of the graph. So for instance, as Ben was talking about just a while ago, we could talk about whether it has just one component. All the nodes are in one component. So you can, you, can, you can find a path from any node to any other node. That's a property of a graph. So we can say, what's the probability of this property holding as a function of P of N? Well, if this property is going to one, as P of N is larger than T of N, so we, we, as we let P of N become large relative to T of N, if this property goes to one, and it goes to zero as p of n becomes small, then we say that this is a threshold function. So if p is below this, the, the graph is not going to have this property. And if p is above this, the graph is going to have this property. Okay? So that's going to be the definition of a threshold function. So is it clear what a threshold function is? Okay. And in and, and terminology that mostly comes out of statistical physics, but you can find earlier in the some of the mathematics literature, a phase transit, we'll say that a phase transition occurs at a, at a given threshold if you're switching from this one property, a property holding with probability zero to a property holding with probability one as you cross this threshold. Okay? Okay. So in terms of these Poisson random graphs, these Rodash Rennie random graphs, you know, we could just pick, say, 50 nodes. I put in P.01. I start to get something which just looks like a few links forming. Um, P.03, I start getting uh, a giant component starting to form and uh, some cycles. Um, there's still isolated nodes. Uh, I'll give you some of the thresholds in a minute. Then P.05, things start to, now it's about two and a half. Um, the degree, average degree is about two and a half. So now the network starts to look like one large component, a few isolates. And then by the time I get to you know, here, um, uh, five, the, the network is connected with very high probability. And you can get bounds on how quickly that probability goes to one. Okay, so, so this thing is looking fairly connected. So what, what did Erdos and Renyi originally prove about this kind of model? Um, they looked at different thresholds. And the thresholds, one over n squared for p, is a threshold where below this, if p is, is below one over n squared, then the chance that you have links is going to zero. You're just not going to get any links. And then once you're above this, you're going to start getting some links. Then you go to one over n to the three halves, and you start getting a few links that are going to start sticking together. So you start getting some components that emerge. 
Then 1 over n is the really interesting threshold. This is where your degree is 1, right? So 1 over n, then each person has an expected number of links of about 1. This is the point where the network starts to have a unique giant component. And giant component here is defined to be a component with at least n to the a nodes for some a less than 1. So a non-trivial fraction of the nodes can path, are path connected to each other. This is happening at this, at this number one, okay? And, and when we talk about diffusion, this is gonna be what's known in biology as the basic reproduction number. So one is the number, so think about, say, say take a, a flu virus. If one person gets infected, what's the expected number of persons that that person infects? If they inf infect more than one, if it's greater than one, then you expect this, this process to mushroom. So I mean, that, that person infects more than one, they infect more than one each, that starts expanding, and you get uh, an epidemic. If it's less than one, then it dies off. So one is the critical number, and one is going to be the same thing in a graph. That's going to be the point at which you start getting a connected component, and below one, um, you're going to just have lots of, of small, isolated um, components. Yes? Um, so it's, it's um, the size of the giant component, um, we'll, we'll, we'll actually do a calculation on that um, uh, on Thursday, I guess. Yeah, Thursday or Friday. So, so we, we will go through a calculation of that. Um, and it's, non, it's not going to be linear, no. So it won't be proportional. And it, it depends very much on, on um, uh, P. And what's going to happen is the size of the giant component is going to really um, very quickly um, switch and it, it, it we'll be able to get a precise um, e expression for that. But, but it won't, it... <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, I mean, I, uh, when it's exactly one over n, I don't, I don't, you'd have to look in Balabash's book for what happens exactly. I'm sure he has a, a lemma on it somewhere. Um, but, you know, right at one over n, things are really, so right at these thresholds, things are, are almost indifferent and, and it's, it's really hard to tie things down right at the thresholds. So I, I, I don't know what happens exactly at the threshold, but I know at this, that threshold's a really extreme one and, and there it's not even that you need ratios. So here, you know, the, the definition of this, of a threshold function is if P over this T is going to infinity or P over this T is going to zero, that's saying that you know, P is much larger than the threshold or much smaller. In that world, if P is, is equal to T plus some epsilon or T minus some epsilon, you still get the same threshold. So for some of these theorems, you can, you can, you know, the threshold is really, really tight. And how tight that is about how far P has to be from T, but right at T, it's really hard to, to specify what happens. I, I just don't know the answer to that one. Yes? Right, I mean, so you could do a lot of things by simulations. The, you know, the, 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 the idea here is really to sort of understand a little bit, you know, you, by, by computer, you, uh, you know, by hit or miss, you might eventually um, figure these things out. But, but analytically, um, if I give you a particular property, some properties are going to be harder to, um, to calculate, uh, you know, the, do by, by estimation. And I, I think also, you know, one thing that's handy about these is the proofs behind these theorems. Of, of the threshold functions are actually informative in themselves. They teach you sort of um, why it's happening and what, what's going on. And uh, I'll say a little bit about how the, most of these threshold theorems are proven. And if you go back to the original erdos renyi papers, effectively what they used is what's known as Chernoff bounds. So, you know, here you've got basically a lot of, uh, most of these links are being formed by coin flips, right? So they're, they're essentially random independent events. And so what's the chance that I get a bunch of them um, and, and so having a property that the graph has a connected component, um, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go this way. You know, what's the chance that, that I can get from any node to any other one? Well, the chance of having this node be disconnected from this would be the chance that this node is not connected to any of the other nodes. What's the chance of that happening? I can approximate it by an exponential function. 
And once I approximate it by that exponential function, it's really easy to say if I'm a little bit above this exponent, I, it, it'll go to zero. If I'm a little bit below, it'll go to one. And then I've got that threshold. And so the theorems are actually not that tricky to prove. Um, there's a lot of like, you know, details you have to work out, but the, the real logic behind the, the theorems is quite, quite pretty, very simple, and, and not, not difficult. But in basically, if you go through Balabash's book, I think about a third of the theorems are proven using Chernoff. Um, and then various exponential um, expansions. Okay, so, so just questions on this background? Okay. So the last one, did you say anything? Log oh, yeah, log n over n is, is, a, is another important one. And log n over n, so this is basically, so p being proportional to log n over n, so that says, then if I multiply both sides by n, that gives me the expected degree. Is saying that once I've got an expected degree that's proportional to log n, then the network is connected with probability one. Once I'm above that threshold, then the chance that every node can communicate with every other node um, is going to one. So that's the critical point at which we get expansiveness and, and things are, are the whole society becomes connected. And um, so, so working most of the theorems in random graph theory in, in Balabash's book are, for interesting properties are, are sort of proven above this um, threshold because then you know that, that you, any node can communicate with any other node and, and so paths are connected in a network and um, everything works. Right, exactly. So, so, so n over a, where a is less than 1, will tell us that we're going to have a giant component, but the fraction of the size of the giant component compared to the overall network could still be um, quite small. And unless, you know, there's sort of a limbo range here where this, until we get pretty close to log n, uh, for p being log n over n, then we're going to be in a range where the size of the giant component is a fraction of the total, it still could be close to zero. Okay, um, so, so let me take you through then uh, a, a quick um, look at, so you know, the, the first point is that the erdos renyi random graph misses um, clustering. And that was sort of the, the first point in one of the um, important papers in the early, that sort of jump-started the statistical physics literature to a large extent, uh, along with the Barabasi paper, was um, a paper by Watson and Strogatz in 1998 and what they noticed was, okay, look, you've got these erdos renyi random graphs out there. There seem to be two features of things that we've noticed in the world. One is that um, there seems to be a lot of clustering, and these random graphs don't have that. The other feature is that the world seems to have this sort of short average path length. And Ben sort of alluded to that in, in his lecture this afternoon. And there, um, you know, sort of the idea is, let's suppose that we have... Um, you know, we, we try and think of expanding outwards. We want to make sure that we include all n nodes. Um, let's suppose I'm, I, I think about expanding outwards at a rate d. So I start with a tree where the first person has d connections. Then we're getting more connections at each level. And this is obviously d minus 1, but I'm going to uh, be a little heuristic here. So take this as d, an expansion at rate d. How many steps do I have to go out until I've reached the whole population? Well, n equals d to the l is how many steps I have to go out until I've reached the whole population. If I solve that, I get l equals log n over log d. Right? So it says I'd have to go log n steps over log of how fast I was expanding in order to reach the whole population. Okay, so that gives us an idea of, of um, as Ben was, was talking about in terms of the exercise, of how many steps, what's the diameter of this graph, how, how far do you have to go out uh, in order to make sure that you've gotten all the nodes. Okay, the amazing thing about the erdos renyi random graphs is that if you look at the actual diameter in the case where we're above this threshold, so the network actually connects so that we can get from any node to any other node, is the diameter is going to 1. The probability that the diameter is log n over log d is going to 1 as well, within a, within a tight factor, actually. So, so the, the, the actual diameter of those graphs is going to look 
just like we just drew a tree and expanded at that rate. I, I'm not going to go through proof of that, but, but that, take that as, a, as that, that Erdos Schrödinger random graphs are going to look, they're not going to have much clustering. The fact that they don't have much clustering means they look lar largely like trees. Trees are going to expand at a rate d, and you're going to end up with this kind of calculation where the diameter of the graph, of a random graph, actually is going to look like log n over log d once we're past this bottom threshold where we're connecting the graph. So here d is like log n. Um, so d is then, is, is, is p. Like log n, yeah. It's p times n. It's p times n, so it's going to be like log n. So it's going to be log n over log log n right at the threshold. And then above that, it, it could be that we've set p higher. But at, at the threshold, it's going to be log n over log log n, yes. So, so basically, what's important about that is it's much smaller than n, right? So it's, it's not as if when we grow our graph that, that if, we, if we say, look, we want to connect, you know, 100 people, it takes 10 connections. We connect uh, a million people that it's going to take, you know, um, uh, close to a million people. It, it, or sorry, uh, you know, the path length is going, is scaling much faster downwards than the, um, than, than n. Okay, so wh wh why is that important? So what er watson strogatz were after is the feature that you have small average path length in a graph, which tends to be true of empirical graphs, and that you also have this high clustering, right? So remember we saw that this clustering, the frequency of these links was quite high in the data compared to an erdos any random graph. So what they did is built a simple model, and their simple model is this this is basically captured in this picture where what they did is they said, okay, let's start with a lattice. So we'll start with people living in a neighborhood and each person is connected to their two closest neighbors. So we'll put people in this, this ring and then you're connected to your two closest neighbors. So if we did that, if we started with just this red network, the clustering would actually be fairly high, right? So out of my pairs of friends, I have non-trivial numbers of them that are connected to each other. Okay, and then what they did is say, okay, well, that, that, that has one feature. So you start with connections along the circle? Yeah, you start with connections. along. you connect any other pair or what? Yeah, so I haven't said the second part yet. Oh. So the first part is we'll get high clustering if we just had this, this, this ring, ring lattice structure. So I, I, I start with just me connected to my, my two closest friends. I, I start with high clustering. Okay. High clustering. I mean, my two neighbors are not connected. No, so they're connected to their, sorry, I'm connected to my four closest neighbors. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 four closest neighbors. And so then when I look at my, my, my neighbors, a, a lot of, yeah, two on each side, yes. So I'm connected to the two neighbors on each side. So then they're connected, and so now out of the... Yes. No, the clustering, so the clustering in this graph, when you look at the pairs of my friends, so let's look at node one. They're in clusters of size three, but remember the yeah, clustering, the, the, yes, they're in several clusters. So, yeah, yeah and, and so the, the, the point is, what we're looking at is the clustering coefficient. And the clustering coefficient was looking okay. at, at I've, I've, got I've got pairs of friends, how, how yeah. transitive closure, yeah, exactly. Okay. And so what they're saying now is, this is a graph that would give us high transitive closure, gives us high clustering. But it also has high diameter. So if you want to get from node 7 to node 19, um, without these blue lines, you would have to go a long way around to get there. So if you started building things just in terms of a local neighborhood structure, so suppose you just use geography to build it and say, oh, that's why we've got clustering. Because everybody's just connecting to the geography. Geography, then all my friends are friends with each other because they also live close to each other. That's the answer. Well, that wasn't the answer because then how do we explain the fact that the average distance is actually much smaller? And the Erdos Renyi got the average distance right, but doesn't have clustering. The ring would have clustering, but wouldn't have the small average distance. So what they said is, well, why don't we just put a little bit of them, why don't we mix these two models? So we'll start with this ring lattice, and then we'll take a few of these links out and rewire them. So take some of the ones that were to my neighbor, and instead just suppose that I, I form a random link with one of those. 
Okay, so then you start rewiring some of the links and, and popping them randomly across the... And their point was it doesn't take many of those to actually give you something that looks like the erdos renyi distance where these sort of form highways across the network which then end up connecting lots of people at short distances. And so by doing a little bit of rewiring, you shorten the average distance in the graph. But if you're connected to most of your local friends, so it doesn't take many of us that have friends across countries to actually connect the countries and people within the countries um, at fairly short distances. That was the basic idea of their model. Okay. So you go through, and, and this is the, uh, the actual graph from their original um, uh, Picture. So this is, this is the probability that I rewire. So unfortunately, they used P here. So um, this is the probability that I take a link that was in the graph, the original uh, lattice that I started with, and I rewire it. So I, I instead put it randomly somewhere in the graph. And if I, if I go all the way to 1, then basically I've got erdos renyi on this x. This is the erdos renyi graph. If I'm all the way at 0, then I'm in the lattice, this ring lattice. And then as you go in between, what they were noticing is as you increase P, it doesn't take much. This is this graph right here. These points are what's the average distance in the graph compared to the average distance. Um, so how, how quickly is the average distance in the graph approaching the erdos renyi random distance? And then... It's average distance, not diameter. It says diameter there, so it's not diameter. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, actually, in, in these graphs, it's not going to matter. So the average distance and the diameter are going to be pretty close to each other. So that's another theorem from Erdos and Renyi that, 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 that very quickly the average distance and the diameters are going to be, be close. That's not Erdos Renyi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not quite that model. So yes, but, uh, but, but here, yeah, think of this as diameter. So the diameter is coming down very rapidly. And then this is the ratio of the clustering. So the clustering stays high. So I, I don't, it doesn't take many of these nodes. So this is in a log plot. I, I sort of start rewiring, and the clustering can stay high for a while at the same time as the distance becomes low. So if what I go... N, what n is this? Because uh, it says p in absolute value. So what n are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, I don't remember exactly how many nodes they used. What 0.01 means. Yeah, yeah. So they used... Uh, oh, boy, I don't remember. Um, it's, it's in the hundreds of nodes. So it wasn't, they weren't big simulations. Yes. So, so uh, the, expected, the expected was like one or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And basically it didn't take long until you got to that. Um, yes. It's, it's more than 25. It was more than 25, but I don't remember how many they used in their simulation. Okay. So, so what's the point of looking at this? And I didn't want to, I don't want to go into the model in too much detail because the model in some sense isn't that interesting um, as a mathematical object. It's, it's just interesting in terms of putting two things together. Yes, you can actually do this both ways. So um, there's a separate paper by Dodds, Watts, and Strogatz, which does the just adding links. And the original paper, what it does is you take a link, you randomly pick a link in the paper, and then you randomly add, um, replace it with a, with a new link. So, so you just uh, pick, a, pick a, a link in the graph, put in a new one at random. Pick a link in the graph, put in a new one at random. And, and you can also do this, the similar thing by starting with a ring and then just adding links at random. Um, and th they're two different models, but they both have similar statistical properties in terms of clustering and diameter. Yeah, so these are these are, are, are by simulation you can prove you can prove results on this model now. I mean it's not hard to prove results on this model. So it's close enough to the Erdash Reni that the, the techniques um, in, in the clustering coefficients you can get exact calculations for, so it's it's not a hard model to solve. And it was studied actually in the you do Erdash Reni and then on top of it you stick a the original ones. That's right, and that, that was the Dodds, Watts, Strogatz, because that one was the easier one to actually solve analytically, and the rewiring one's t slightly yeah, trickier. Yes. And so. The number of such. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Small relative e size. E exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so getting these results out of that version of the model is very straightforward. And so, it's, uh, uh, as I was just pointing out, that, that, that makes the math very easy. 
but the, the sort of the point of this was to say that um, you know you you don't need much change. You don't need many uh, random links to really shrink the diameter of the graph. And there might be some other structure that's providing high clustering, which has to do with geography. So that was a, sort of the point of it. What, what I want to say about this is what, you know, what, what's missing from this kind of model from an economist perspective is why on earth do we start with a lattice and then why do we add some random links? Where are they coming from? Why would this be a sensible model? How many should we be adding? Should we be over here? Should we be over here? You know, are we in this range where we still have high clustering in this or are we over here? You know, why, why, why do we think that this should be a model that makes any sense? So we might want to add more in terms of having a model which, which tells us a little bit of, of where the links are coming from rather than you know, just saying, okay, look, we can get these two. So the nice part about this paper is it shows us you know, what, what is necessary to sort of put into the mix to get things out, but it doesn't necessarily answer the questions of whether we should expect it or not expect it or under what circumstances we'd see it or whether it's a good or bad um, outcome. Yes. So even if we have Yes, yeah, yeah. So another thing that's true about this, um, so this model does not fit de degree distributions well. So the problem is if you're in this range where you still have high clustering and, and um, low, uh, um, low average path length, so you're in this nice range which seems to match it's things on that. It's a shift of Poisson, Poisson plus four. Well, it's Poisson plus four, but, but what ends up happening is that the Poisson ends up being really low, and then you end up with very regular graphs almost. So for the really low Ps, it looks almost like most people have degree four, right? So, so you end up with a population of, of almost every, you know, there's a big spike at four, and then, and then a little bit of a Poisson added in. So the, in the range where you don't push things over too far, you end up with something which, which looks like a really peculiar degree distribution in terms of what you get out. And so that, it doesn't match the data very well. Uh, and so it's sort of still missing some fundamental things. But this then sort of started the statistical physics literature, which had a lot of um, hammers um, uh, coming into the literature and, and figuring out, you know, that we have a lot of analytic tools that can be, begin to be used in, in analyzing these kinds of processes. Um, so it was an important paper, both uh, in, in jump-starting the literature, but also in, in sort of pointing out that it doesn't take much to change a model dramatically in terms of some properties. You can get an explicit formula in this, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so that's just sort of a, a quick background on some of these classic random graph models. Now I want to spend a little time on, on strategic form, uh, formation, and then we'll go back and look at some other models and, and talk about econometric models. And this is just, to, again, to give you more of a flavor of how these models work, so we'll take a, a very different look. Um, and here what we're going to be doing is now we have costs and benefits for people forming links. Um, agents are choosing links. And we'll contrast, you know, incentives and efficiency. So we'll be able to look at different kinds of questions. But these models, the problem is we're not going to be able to solve them for very rich settings. So we're going to have to look at pretty stark models in order to solve them explicitly. Okay. Lots of modeling choices. Um, you know, are we, t are we forming weighted networks? Are we forming directed networks? Are we forming undirected networks? Um, is consensus needed to form a relationship? You know, can, can we coordinate on changes? Can, can three of us get together and form links at the same time, or is it all bilateral? Um, how sophisticated are we? Are we forward-looking rational agents that are full game theorists, or are we uh, myopic people who are just doing something like in Schelling's model, where we move if, if we don't like our neighborhood? Um, so, so there's all kinds of different choices that we can make in modeling, and they all make a difference. So, um, that's good news and bad news. The bad news is that means it's going to be hard to sort of summarize the literature saying, okay, this is what we found. Um, I can't give you a one-liner, um, but it means that there's lots of interesting things to study. And, I, you know, you could say this about most game theory, right? The, 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 it's, a, it's a rich subject when you get down to the choices that you make. Okay. So which networks are likely to form? Um, are they going to be efficient? Can interventions help? Um, can we say something about the kinds of networks that are going to emerge? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just take you through uh, a, a, an approach that I worked out with Asher Walensky in now 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so, so basically, the idea now is that, that we're going to have a graph out there and people are going to get payoffs from the graph. So as a function of the graph, each node gets a payoff. 
So I get some utility, costs and benefits from it. Maybe I'm a country, I've got some world trade that's coming in and, and you want to measure my, my GDP and I think of my GDP as my, my utility. Or um, we think of a uh, person and, and how much information is flowing into the person as a, as a gauge of how well off they are. And we're going to think of undirected network formation for now. Okay. So I'll start with just a simple example, which we call the connections model. So the idea was that there's some value, there's some benefit for having a relationship between two nodes, call that delta. So there's a value of delta, but I also get, I get value from indirect relationships. So the idea here is say, um, two people form a link, one and two, they get a value of delta from forming that relationship and they pay a cost C, okay? Okay, so that's, that's not that hard. Um, what happens when we get another relationship forming? Well, this is where the externalities come in. The interesting part for the network formation comes in when, this, when one forms a relationship with three, well, one's utility just looks like two delta minus two C, so they have two relationships, nothing very interesting there. But what, what the other two people get is they get indirect benefits. They've formed one relationship, so they've got the delta minus C, but they're getting a delta squared value from indirect communication. So think of this as, you know, if maybe messages are spent, sent probabilistically with some probability delta, what's the probability that something would get from one to two delta? What's the probability something would get from three to two delta squared? So I get less value from having friends of friends, but there's still some value to having that. Yes? If one to pay the C in order to maintain the link, yes. there is not like a free riding. Right, right, right. So here we'll make it really simple and it'll be symmetric. If two people form a link, they both pay a cost C and we'll just make that uniform across individuals. Um, you can enrich the, the cost structure and have various, you can have bargaining over costs and so forth. But for this version, let's just assume that, that when we form a friendship, it's just some time commitment that we have to spend with each other and we each spend that time and, and it costs C. Okay. So you can begin, and in, in let's keep, keep adding things in, you know, then we'll have delta cubes for, for distance three and so forth. And so as a function of any network, you can begin to make predictions of what the payoffs are. So for any given network, you get payoffs for all the agents. So now we've got basically a network formation game. Everybody's got some, some different networks that give them different payoffs, and we'd like to choose a network. So everybody's got some choices, and the question is, what's, how do you model a network formation game? So who, who can make which choices? It's not that person four can say, okay, I want this network because this one's really good for me. Um, w the choices are gonna be made by, bilaterally by the different agents forming the relationships. Is there a question? Oh. Okay. So um, in here, once we've got, uh, say, you know, between four can reach three two different ways, we're, we'll just count the shortest path. To make our calculations easy, we won't keep track of all the walks that, that uh, Ben was talking about. We could do all the walks. That's going to be more complicated. We'll just keep track of short, shortest paths for payoffs. So for every network, we've got a, a list of payoffs. Okay. So now we want to ask which network might be best for society, what maximizes the overall payoffs, and then which ones are going to be formed by the agents. So those are the two questions we'll look at. Okay, so, so to model incentives, um, I'm going to start with the following suggestion, and we can talk about alternatives. What we'll do is we'll just call a network pairwise stable if the following things are true. No agent wants to sever a relationship they're in. So nobody is in a relationship that, if they got rid of it, would increase their payoff. So this is simple. The second one is that no two agents gain from adding a link. Okay, so there's no two people who, if they both added the relationship, would both be better off. One gaining strictly and one uh, weakly. It doesn't matter whether you, it doesn't really matter which way you do it. So is that, is, is that clear what the, the notion is here? Okay, now, um, what, so basically in terms of notation, what we're saying is we're looking at a given network G and now I'm going to use this sort of set notation. I'm abusing notation a little bit. I could sever a link J. Um, the, what the utility they have to get from being in this network has to be bigger than what they get from severing it. And if somebody strictly gains from adding a link, then it should be that the partner doesn't want to add it. Otherwise, it should have been added. 
So if, if I'm really gaining from adding a relationship, the only reason it wasn't added is because my partner didn't want to. Otherwise, it would have got added. Okay? We'll call that pairwise stable. So is it clear what the notion is? So you know, why, why, are we, why did we use pairwise stability instead of using some other notion of, of link formation? Well, once you start modeling link formation, if we want to capture the fact that two people can form a, a new relationship, if we use something instead like Nash equilibrium and said, okay, people are just going to tell us who they want as partners, then you run into all kinds of multiple equilibrium problems. And you get these problems because, you know, let's imagine that, that we take a really simple setting. There's a value one to, to having relationships in. There's value zero. If we don't have the relationship, and now we ask people to, to both simultaneously say whether they, they want to form the relationship. Well, there's one equilibrium where they both say yes. There's also an equilibrium where they both say no, right? And, and that problem means that if I'm, I can't use Nash equilibrium as a solution, I'm going to get all kinds of things where any kind of network would be supported because two people don't add a link because they both fail in this coordination problem. I can try and use things like Turnblingham perfection or pro a proper, I can try and use refinements of equilibria, it becomes an absolute mess and it doesn't necessarily give you what you want in this world. So, so to circumvent this problem, we instead use this notion of just directly checking, you know, that the, the link is added if it makes sense, but not otherwise. And, and this will just make it easier. We'll avoid a lot of game theoretic problems, but it won't be Nash equilibrium off the shelf. Yeah, so um, core stability is going to be then looking at, so another possibility is we could look at multiple people adding multiple links and so forth. The problem with the core stability is generally going to be emptiness in a lot of settings. So there's going to be a lot of settings where we're not going to end up with many predictions out of it. But it, it, it makes sense in some settings. And I think it depends very much on the context too. If we think about people adding links on LinkedIn or on, on Facebook or something, basically that, you know, you, you, send, you, you ask somebody, they can respond. Um, it's not as if people are forming big groups when you're doing that. You're doing it more, more or less myopically, bilaterally. So those I, I would think of as, a, as this might be a reasonable way to, to think about it. But if we want to think about world trade networks, then we might want to think about something like NAFTA or the European Union or a group of countries getting together and saying, okay, look, we're all going to rewire, add a bunch of links and subtract some other ones. You know, now we're going to put in and say, okay, you can form these new relationships, but you have to get rid of these old ones. So you could imagine that, that something much more along the lines. So the answer, just the short answer is, it depends on the context and core stability is going to be sometimes harder to get predictions out of. But it's certainly applicable in, in some right. richer settings. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we do know it'll give us the right, uh, it, it, yes, exactly. If it exists, then, then we'll get the right networks out um, because everybody's, the, the, the grand coalition can always deviate. So yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so, so let's just look at a quick example with some numbers. So here, you know, just think of, of if everybody's disconnected, they get a value of z zero. Let's suppose that people get three from having a link. Two people, if there's two pairs, they're just getting three. Now in this particular example, so I've just, what see. What see so here I haven't, I, I, this isn't the connections model. These are just numbers I've pulled out of a hat for now. I'm not gonna explain where I got them yet. So I've just some, some hypothetical, so yeah, so these are just net payoffs. Okay. So these include the, co the benefits and the costs, exactly. So, so here, for whatever reason, and, and this is a model that's going to have negative externalities. So in this model, these two people form a relationship, their payoffs have gone up, 3.25, so they're better off forming this, but their partners are, are less happy, right? So these are ones where things, you know, I, I formed a new friendship, I spend less time with my old friends, they're unhappy about that. Right, so I'm just saying so that, that kind of fit the previous one. this is not this is yeah. So this is a different model. So for the purposes of this example, I've pulled out new numbers, and these numbers have a negative externality in them. The previous one had positive externalities exactly. So this is not the connections model. Okay. Yes. Is this anonymous in some sense? Right, exactly. So so take it as any relabeling of the nodes would lead to the same payoff. So I've just put here sort of the essential picture, but think of any configuration that looks like, looks like this with some uh, permutation will have the permuted payoffs associated with it. Exactly. 
Okay, so is it clear what, what we've got in terms of numbers? Okay, so, so um, we can go through and then here, you know, these people then say, oh, well, let's us form a link too. They get up to 2.5, but now they drive, drive their, their partner's payoffs down. Then here, each time a link is added, it's benefiting the two people in, in question, but it's hurting their partners. And so we go through and, and eventually we end up with um, this network, 2.33. And what do the arrows represent? The arrows here, yeah, this is, yeah, so in this case, exactly. So in this particular case, the pairwise stable is going to push us to the full graph. And what the arrows are indicating is moves that are helping the people involved. So in each case, these people would want to add the link. These people would want to add a link. So these arrows say we would follow a path that looks like this. If people were sort of myopically looking around, somebody would add a link, somebody would add another link. It might follow different paths. You know, we could, there are different arrows that we could put in here as well. But the basic point is, as, as Sergio is pointing out, in this world, the only pairwise stable network is going to be the complete network. So in this one, we end up um, you know, completely connecting the graph. And what's bad about that? Well, if we look at the payoffs everybody's getting, that's worse than what they could have gotten if they started stopped sooner, right? And that's not surprising. In any world where you have uh, externalities, you're going to tend to have problems in, in the network formation. People aren't taking into account the fact that I formed this new relationship and I hurt my friends. Okay. So basically. It's also an issue of myopia. Yes. So they're myopic. So, they're so myopia. exactly. So one, one answer to this is, as, as Alkanan is pointing out, maybe it's the myopia that's the problem. So if people could stop here and sort of, if they, figure they figure out, look, stop. if we add this, then they're going to add this and we're going to end up here. Let's stop here. And for this particular example, that works out. And there is a, there's a literature on far-sighted network formation. Um, it doesn't necessarily give you efficient outcomes. So it, it gives you different outcomes, but it's going to be hard to, now we have to figure out where, where, where would we go and what's our definition of where we go. And so we, we needed some notion of far-sighted stability. So there's a, there's a literature that explores far-sighted network stability. And, and that's another solution. It gives you a different solution in this particular. In this particular setting, it would get you to stop at this. But it actually gives you set-valued solutions and depends on how you do it. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay. So um, let's look at the efficiency. And for the efficiency, we'll, let's use two different notions. One is going to be Pareto efficiency. That just tells us that there doesn't exist some other network such that everybody's at least as well off and somebody's strictly better off. And then um, I'll also just use the word efficient uh, to indicate a utilitarian version of a network, which is just maximizing the total sum of utilities. So this is a world where we somehow believe that there's transferable utility and we're just trying to maximize the overall sum. Um, that's going to be a different notion. Right, so the second one will be relevant in worlds where we can think about transfers and then it's going to be a, one of the efficient networks in, in the other world, but it won't necessarily be the, the right benchmark. Yes. Okay, so what do we end up with? If we look here, um, we end up with this being the efficient network, right? So this was ending up being pairwise stable. We were pushed to this network. This one is the overall maximizer. Um, this is a network which is Pareto efficient, but not maximizing. So you'll have, you know, in any one of these models, right, once you write them down, you'll have one is an, or, or some set of networks that'll be the overall maximizers. You have a larger set, which is going to be Pareto efficient, and you might have a completely different set, which are going to be the ones that people form when they form on them under self-interested dynamics. Okay. So the, the, the basic point is, and there's, there's externalities here, and those externalities are going to manifest themselves in, in driving us towards networks which aren't necessarily the efficient networks um, from a society's point of view. Questions on that? Okay. Okay, now back to this connections model. Um, let's do a, a variation on the connections model, which is going to be that I'll get a utility from a given graph, which is going to be some benefit of how far away I am from, from person J. So if I want to look at person J, let's look at my, the, the length of the shortest path in the graph from me to J. 
how far away am I? And I'll get some benefit which is proportional to that, not proportional, but a function of that. Yeah, we want, decreasing. exactly. So I want this to be a decreasing function of L. So if I'm, if I'm connected to somebody at distance one, it's a higher benefit than at distance two, and distance three, and so forth. So the important thing here is, instead of having delta be exponential, we just have some decaying function, and it could decay very rapidly, it might decay very slowly, but there's some, I have higher values from close relationships, lower values for distance. And then I also pay costs for the relationships I have directly. Okay, so that's a sort of a generalization of that connections model. But we'll keep it symmetric just to make our life easy. Everybody has the same B function and the same C for that they pay for links. Okay? Clear? Okay. So it's the same kind of formula as we had before, except instead of exponents now, these are just B1, B2, B3, etc. Okay. So what do the efficient networks look like in this? And I, I sort of want to go through this just for a reason that this is a fairly simple model, but it captures a lot of, a lot of settings are going to have something where the benefits are decreasing with distance. And so variations on this kind of thing are going to be true in, in uh, different models. It gives us some insight into why um, hub kinds of models or hub kinds of features are efficient networks. So basically what this says is if the cost is low enough, then just connect everybody. Right? If, the, if the cost is lower than the distance, the benefit between a one and a two, um, the complete network is going to be the unique efficient network. Once the cost is bigger than that, if it's less than B1 plus N minus two, B2 over two, and I'll say why that's true in a second, then the star network is the unique efficient network. So star architecture is the unique efficient architecture. Utilitarian, yes. Utilitarian, yes. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here, it's, um, I don't think it's known what the Pareto efficient sets are for this model. Um, it's, it's a mess. So I don't think people know the full Pareto efficient set. Yeah. And then basically, once cost gets high enough, then you, you just disconnect things. But what's, what this is saying is that, that, the, that things fall into sort of simple categories. Either you connect everybody, or it looks like a star. And if you want to maximize overall utilities, those would be the efficient things to do. Okay, so is it clear what this, the, the claim is? Okay. Um, let, let me just go th briefly through the proof. The proof is not that hard, but the basic idea, um, the, the, the key step in the proof is the following. We look at the value of a star, and then compare it to the value of some other network where you're still comp connecting the same set of players. Um, so if I have a value of a star with K players, uh, so here, value, there's the direct links. I've got two times k minus one of those, right? Each person's connected to k minus one others. Um, sorry, the center's connected to k minus one so others, and each, yeah, sorry. Is, yeah, the, the star's connected to everybody else, so each person's connected to the center of the star. And then um, each person is connected at a distance two to n minus two of the, each of the peripheral agents is connected at distance two to all the others. So you get this extra term. Okay, now you go ahead and um, figure out the value of a network with k players and some other number of links, m greater than k minus one. And what that gives you is each one of these links can give you the b1 minus c, right? So each one of these links there's two players involved in that link. They're both a distance one from each other. And then all the other relationships, there's at most all the indirect relationships, how many of those are left? Well, k times k minus one minus the people who've connected directly. And the most that they could be getting is b2, right? So this is just a bound on that payoff. This is, the, this is a, um, uh, an upper bound on the payoff. And now what we do is just compare these two. You take the difference, and this difference ends up being proportional to B2 minus B1 minus C. So just do the math directly, right? So I'm going to get a, a, a difference here, a difference here, and the, the difference then is proportional to B2 minus B1 minus C. And I, this is greater than zero um, only when C... B1 minus C by B2. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And so, so basically here... I, <coughs> Once the cost is low enough, then I just want to connect everything in a star. But if the cost is higher, then, um, 
then, then I'll, I'll, I'll basically not want the, anybody to be connected. Um, and so here, the, the distance, this is going to dominate this as long as C is higher than uh, B2 minus B1. Okay? So basically, it, it, this gives you sort of the, the critical part of the, the proof. So, you know, basically, then you can do other parts to, to sort of finish out the proof. You look at, you know, if I have a star with K players, would I rather have a star with more players? Once I want to form a star with some number of players, I'd rather have a bigger star um, and so forth. No, so I'm not doing stability at all. So this is just a, so here is basically saying, first of all, let's just figure out what's efficient. Okay. And then we can try and figure out what the, so, right, right here. So the star, exactly, you got it. Star is not going to be stable, yes. So what we got is, is basically what we're going to be able to show is now, basically we're not going to get efficient and stability to coincide because the efficient one's always going to have to look like a star or a complete network. It'll, this pairwise stability will give us things when the, when the cost is cheap enough but if the cost gets too high, we're not going to get efficient things. Exactly. So, so, so basically, you can go through the rest of the details. They're in the slides. Um, but but the, the star is uniquely efficient to that middle cost range. Otherwise, you end up with um, empty network or the complete network. Okay. Now, to Elkanan's point, now what, what do we just say about pairwise stable? Well, if, if costs are really, really high, then the empty network's... The efficient one, that means that any network would have negative value. That means nobody wants to form links. It turns out to be pairwise stable. If costs are cheap enough, people will add all the links. Things will be fine. But in this middle range, what's going to happen is that uh, you, you can get the star to be pairwise stable sometimes, but a lot of times you won't. So it depends on where the cost falls. If the cost is low enough, then you can get the star to be pairwise stable. But if the cost becomes high enough, then you end up not having the star be pairwise stable. So then it doesn't make sense for the, for the center of the star to be generating these positive externalities for other individuals. They don't want to bear those costs, right? So, so basically, let's look at a, a simple situation. The payoff to the center in this world, they're bearing three direct costs, three benefits. This is not going to be pairwise stable if the cost is bigger than B1, right? They're just not going to be willing to do that. So the fact that they're generating all these indirect benefits which, which benefit the society, um, if they're not getting that benefit back, they're not going to maintain those relationships. Just a second, when the cost is low, then two, two nodes in the periphery will be like it, or am I missing something? Um, so this is the cost is bigger than B1. Okay. So these two wouldn't want to add that. Okay, but when C, you said that when C is low, the star is stable? Yeah, yeah, so if, if C is low enough, then the, the, it, it will, the, the star network will be pairwise stable. But won't two nodes in the periphery want to form? That's when it's very low. Yeah, so that's only if it's very, very low. When it's very low, it's a complete graph. Yeah, yes. Then you would get a complete, then you would get a complete. No, okay, it's okay. taken down on the previous slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, because basically, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the key thing is, you know, I mean, just in terms of what they've got. So let's think of those two nodes. What happens if they add that? Well, before they were getting B2, yeah. after that they're getting B1 minus C, okay. and so they want to compare these two, yeah. and so that's when you, that's why the comparison is between B and B1 minus B2. But are you asserting that, the, that in that medium low cost case, you're always having multiple equilibria? No, not always, but um, okay. they're, they're okay. depending on how many nodes you have. So if the number of nodes is large enough, so there's a number of nodes which is large enough, such that if if you're in this range, if the number of loads is large enough, then you always get um, multiple equilibria. But the number of nodes if it has to be large enough. If you do have only three, it'll work. And if you have, so actually I can just show you. Separate stars or something? No, you can get things like rings. Oh, rings. So you get rings because now nobody wants to add the, you know, if, and, and people are happy to have, so I, I'm getting shortest paths around the sides of, sides of the ring. And so I don't want to sever any links. But forming one across would only cut distances between different things. And so you can get things that are other ones that are pairwise stable, even though the star um, is also pairwise stable in that region. So here, you know, you can get situations where you've got multiple, multiple networks. And then if you, um, in some range, you can get that this is the unique pairwise stable network that's not empty. So the star would be the efficient one, and yet this would be the only one that's pairwise stable would be a ring. 
So, so depending on the, 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 the setting, you're going to get things that look very different, possibly from the efficient networks. And then a variation on this one can show you that, this, that, um, that you can end up you know, with Pareto dominated. The unique pairwise stable is actually not even Pareto efficient. So, so there, there, there's results along those lines, um, depending on the model. Question, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good question. Uh, let me, okay, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, so there's a bunch of those models. So these are geographic versions of the connections model. So there's a paper by Johnson and Gillies, Cariel and Rue. I have one with Brian Rogers, Galeotti, Goyal, Compost. So there's a bunch of papers where what you do is you add a geographic cost. And, and I think this is, this is a good question because what is, the, what is an economic aspect to add to this now? Um, so let's think of, I'll give you a, ver a simple version of this. So let's think of the connections model where we've got these deltas and delta squares just like we had before, but where we're going to have geography here too. So let's put people on islands and suppose that people are living on different islands and the cost of, of connecting to people on your same island is low, but connecting across islands is high. Okay. So I don't, I, it, 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 you know, it's easy to talk to people on my own island. I have to get in a canoe and go to another island. That's, it's costly to maintain that relationship and, and find out what the news is on the other island. So, so people form relationships on their own island, but there's costs to going across islands. Okay, so we could go through and, you know, you could have, let's let little c be the cost of connecting within an island. So you could get through, you know, this person's, so you can figure out what their payoff is, delta, delta's, you know, how many d people at distance three, distance four, and so forth. So you could do the same kind of connections model. Okay. Um, and now when we do this, so we'll, we'll have low cost for connecting on your own island. So J players live on an island. There's K islands. Cost C of, of connecting to somebody on your own island. Cost big C, bigger than C, of connecting across islands. So now the geography is basically playing a cost reason. So what this is going to tell us is why do we have very few links across islands? What's the intuition now? Well, the intuition is it's costly to form links across islands. But if there's no links across islands, then somebody should gain by forming a link across an island because they're suddenly going to connect to a lot of people across that island, right? So, for instance, here, by, adding, by having this person add this link, they're connecting, they suddenly are connected to a lot of other people. So what you're going to get... Um, you know, when you look at this, this person's willing to pay this cost because they connect to a series of other islands. And so what you end up with is high clustering and low diameter. But you're ending up with high clustering because it's cheaper to connect to people close to you. So you end up with a very dense network in local geography. And the reason you get low diameter is that it pays for people to connect islands because they're suddenly bringing a lot of people much closer together. So I'll pay the big cost because if, if nobody's connecting me, then connecting suddenly gets me a bunch of connections all at once. Does that make sense? So this kind of model has been used to sort of, you know, look at, at um, clustering um, diameter trade-offs. But the difference between this, so what's the plus and the minus of this? The, the plus of this is now we have a, a why to, to why we should get the, the clustering. And the diameter, it all has to do with costs. So low local costs means high clustering, um, high costs across, but large populations that are at greater distances means there won't be few links, but there will be some links at greater distances. And that means also you can get a bound on a diameter because if the diameter becomes too large, then there's no reason for people to connect. Um, then somebody should be connecting across. Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so in this world, you can actually characterize the efficient connections, and, and, and it'll be to have the same person providing connections across islands. So, for instance, once I have one person do the connections, it makes sense for them to do all the connections because then that shortens the overall path lengths. 
So you can actually um, get some characterizations of what the efficient ones are look like exactly. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it will have connections to block models, and but block models are going to be statistical models where people are going to randomly connect depending on their type of, of their type. And you could say that people living on an island are all of one type, and then there'll be probabilities of forming links there. But this is one where instead this gives them um, costs of uh, that are going to be heterogeneous in who they connect to. So this will give different predictions than a block model. Yes. Um, so this is, it turns out, um, not quite to be social quilts, but um, I, I can answer that one offline, maybe, because I don't want to go into trying to explain qu social quilts to everybody. Um, but l let me answer that one afterwards. Yeah. I, I can tell you why they're not. Yes? Can one people from one island create a connection with another island all its friends? Friends from the same island will share the cost. Yeah, so one thing that's not here is how we share costs, right? And so, you know, like in the connections model, we could say, well, maybe the whole problem was, you know, the center of the star wasn't willing to form these relationships, but then maybe people should be subsidizing the center to form the relationships. So we didn't talk at all about, you know, maybe we all get together and share costs, we'll solve all these problems and we'll get efficient networks out because we're all willing to kick in costs to, to get the efficient formation. And so then what we have to do is now start thinking about, well, how do we actually model the bargaining process that goes over of who's going to pay which costs for which re relationships? And then we end up with a model which involves bargaining over, over costs and, and network formation at the same time. And so there's some papers that look at, at, at that. Um, so people have looked at, at that process. I have a paper with Francis Block. Um, there's stuff with Sergio Carrini and Paulo Pin. Uh, so, so, so Sergio Corrini and Massimo Morelli have a paper where, where you, you bargain over the, the network and the payoffs you're going to get. So there's different ways to write it down, but now we have to take a, a stand on a bargaining game. So how are we going to actually spread the, 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 um, the transfers out? Yeah, we have diplomats and so forth. Let me show you an example that maybe I think sheds light on that. Um, th this is, I, I, I like this example um, because it's, it's very simple and it, it'll sort of make the point of why. So, so one question is, it, I think it's an important question for this literature is, well, maybe this is all nonsense. Maybe the, we'll always get efficient networks because people can bargain and let's take Coase really seriously, right? So Coase says, look, if we have property rights and we can make offers and we can bargain properly, we should be able to solve any inefficiency problems because if there's really an externality and you're benefiting me by indirect connections, I'll just pay you to say, look, form that new relationship or, you know, so take care of all these externalities. And what this example does is show that in a network setting, part of the difficulty is that you're trying to deal with multiple externalities at the same time. And so the bargaining problem isn't so trivial. And so, so let's just go through this example really quickly. So, so let's suppose that, that we, we look at a network here. This network has value, you know, everybody has a value of four. Overall value is 12. Then we look at a network like this. Um, payoffs are here, values are 13. And then if we go down again to a smaller network, we get values of 12. So we think of this and let's imagine that the empty network has a value of zero. So this is the setting. And now we start looking at, at um, what's pairwise stable and what's efficient. Well, what's efficient is, you know, pick any one of these, they give us a value of 13. Um, these would be the efficient networks. Moreover, they're the Pareto efficient networks in this world, right? So these are the ones, well, they're Pareto efficient. These are also Pareto efficient. Um, but but um, these are the overall maximizers. And now we say, can we make these pairwise stable? Okay. So why are they not pairwise stable? Well, this is the sort of center of the star problem, right? This person is maintaining these two links. They would actually get a, a value of six if they cut this relationship. So they should just cut one of the relationships and they'd be down to, to, to a six. Okay, so what has to happen? Well, it has to be that these people should need to pay this person. So this person has to get six, okay? So now we go through some bargaining procedure and these people make an offer to, to, to five. But what happens then? 
Well, somebody here is going to be pushed down below their four if they're making a transfer to five, right? Well, that, it, it, once we push these down, we also have to make sure, in order to make this pairwise stable, we've maybe gotten this person happy not to cut their link. But once we've taken money away from these people, now they'd be better off forming a link and pushing it back up here. So the problem is that there's, you know, once they're making transfers to this person to keep them happy, then they're unhappy enough that they'd be better off forming a new link. And so then this thing becomes destabilized by going up here. So the fact that we're trying to take care of, we solve one externality, but that doesn't allow us to, to, to take care of the other one at the same time. So the fact that you've got multiple externalities and you're trying to get one thing to be stable with one set of transfers means it's going to be very difficult to stabilize um, it all, to get it all to work at the same time. So, so is it clear how, what this? Yes? What's the motivation for this payoff? Why would the, the guy at the bottom right be less happy with another friend than with only one friend? Yeah, so generally, you know, the question is why aren't we happy having friends why do we ever stop adding friends? Well, at some point, there's diminishing returns to friendship. So the idea here is that, you know, if I like friends. I don't, you know, I've only got so much time in the world. So the idea here is, you know, five is now spreading themselves more thinly, and they don't want to do that. In this example, it's sort of extreme. You know, once they get, they, they really just want one friend. This is monogamy here. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the second friend's not. Uh, other questions? Okay, but, but the, the point of this example is that, that you know, it, I think in the network setting, externalities are not e easily solved, even with complete information. It's not going to be trivial to undo all the externalities by bargaining and so forth. And so the literature that's, that's sort of gone, you know, the game theoretic literature of this, um, what's the advantage and disadvantage? The advantages are we can really solve some models and get answers as to why we're seeing certain kinds of things. We can make welfare statements, so we can say, you know, when is it that we're going to get efficient networks? When are we going to get inefficient networks? So we can also quantify the extent of the, uh, uh, of the inefficiencies. So there's a bunch of things which is really good about them. The hard part about this is I, I don't know how to take this to data. So, you know, you, if you give me the network from one of these Indian villages which has kerosene and rice, this is pretty hard, this is pretty far away from something I can take to data and actually fit the utility functions or make predictions about how the network's going to evolve and so forth. So this isn't something that I can fit yet. The statistical models, I can begin to, to tune parameters and then see how well they match the data. This one's going to be really hard to tune parameters and match to data. So this isn't one that's going to be easy to do that with. Um, okay. <coughs> Other kinds of things I want to say. So yeah, I think um, in terms of that, so enriching, you know, we, we enrich these on lots of dimensions. Um, we talked about, you know, can you match observables? Well, yes, you can get clustering and, and uh, short average path length at the same time by putting, putting different kinds of geography. There's a version of this model by Cariel and Rue, which, you know, sort of gets a similar picture to the um, Watson Strogatz, where you can get the diameter to drop and keep the clustering high. Um, so I won't go through all of that. Um, so, so basically what we've done so far is look at these two different classes of models. And based on these two different classes of models, we've seen uh, very different advantages and disadvantages. What we'll do next is I'm going to talk tomorrow uh, morning about the Barabasi and um, Albert uh, preferential attachment model and start talking about you know, what are growing net random network models add how do they begin to give us more of the picture in terms of what's going on and where do they fall short in terms of, of fitting things? Then I'll talk about the models that were mentioned a bit ago, block models. So we'll talk a little bit about what are the different approaches econometrically that have, have done this. And I think most of the, the current um, literature is sort of in this last four class of models. And I'll say a little bit about how those are working and what the advantages and disadvantages are. But the, there's still a lot to be studied. And here, this is just sort of a really quick snapshot of the literature, giving you an idea of very different approaches that have been used, very different questions that can be ans asked and answered. Um, but it, it sort of uh, gives us a, a, a jumping off point for, for talking more about it.
So I think this is probably a good place, rather than starting something new at this point, um, let's, let's stop for, for now, and we'll start up again uh, tomorrow morning. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Omar Meyerson fits into yes, yeah, 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 yeah. A special case, uh, but, I, but I'm not sure if there is uh, increasing as you're looking at the, the Meyerson value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah it's yeah. not clear that the increase.